January is focus on the family month. All right, and uh, we're going we're going to focus on the family, primarily the church family, but also the nuclear your personal fam, nuclear family, because they're both the same thing. All righty, families are in trouble in this nation. Church families are in trouble in this nation. We just finished something called Christmas. For many people, it was just the most wonderful time. You know why? Wasn't a reindeer, because they got to be with family. For many people, it was a terrible time. I read article after article on counseling sites about how to prepare people for the pain of Christmas because they have to be around their families. We're in trouble with our families. And uh, this, shouldn't, this shouldn't ought to be. We shouldn't be in trouble with our families. <clears throat> Me and you were created for two things. We were created and we were created with a purpose. We were created to know God as our Father. He is a good, good Father and we were created to know Him and enjoy Him. The other reason we were created is to enjoy people. That's it. The money doesn't matter. The accomplishments will be gone one day. The only thing coming out of this earth is relationships with the Father and with people. We were created for two things. We were created to enjoy the Father, and we were created to be in a family. And uh, God Almighty created the earth. He created people. They related to Him. What is the first institution He put in this earth? Family. A man and his wife, and they had kids. Family is the foundation of all society. Family is the heart of God. And uh, we got in trouble. These great relationships were destroyed by sin. But let me tell you what Jesus came to this earth to do. He came to fix both of our problems. 1 Peter 3.18, Jesus suffered on the cross, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us back to our Father. I have got a father who loves me, looks after me, enjoys me, and I enjoy him because of what Jesus did at the cross. That's what Jesus came to do. But Jesus also came to build a family and to fix families. All right, does anybody know the name of the first pastor in the first church ever? The answer is yes. His name was Jesus. God came down to this earth. What's the first thing he did? He gathered a group of people around him. He started out with 12, and then it expanded to 70. And what did he say to them? I'm going to teach you how to do family, and I'm going to teach you how to relate to each other. And for three years, he taught people who hated each other, people that were not alike at all. He taught them how to live differently in family. Now, his death on the cross brought me back to the Father. But what he did on this earth for three years as he drew he drew the goofed up as people around him. Can I get a witness it's okay to have goofed up people in a church? Amen. So far, so good. So he drew them around him and he said, what's the primary thing Jesus taught in three years on this earth? How to do family with each other. How to relate to each other. How to get along with each other. So today we're going to start with family done right. We're going to talk about family done right. And uh, dear ones, I'm going to, I say this over and over because I'm here to help you. Life is just relationships. It's not, it's not how much money you make. You know, it's, it's not where you went to school. Life is relationships. I wake up every day and look forward to two things. Number one, I'm going to get to be with Jesus today. And I'm going to get to enjoy Jesus. And we will have the best time. And I'm going to get to be around people today. So, Brother, around people suck. They're awful. Okay, we got some work to do here. <laughs> Dear ones, to follow Jesus only means two things. You learn how to relate to him. And you learn how to build relationships with people. That's all it is. That's life, Doc. That, that's the whole, that's all it is. Every, my joy every day is to be with Jesus, and I love to be around people. You know what my favorite part of our services is? It's not the preaching. I've already heard that. It's before and after service. I get to be around the people, and I get to hug the people and enjoy the people. Listen, till you enjoy people above everything else, something's wrong. We were created to be in relationship with Jesus and people. That's life. That's what the whole thing is. So that's what Jesus came to teach us. We're going to talk about family done different. I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. We're going to spend this month talking about family. And this, we're going to talk about church family, also to your personal family. Families need help in this nation. The foundation of a nation is its family. The foundation of a nation is its families. A man who sits on the school board in this county, it's been about three years ago, they were discussing the terrible problems that we're having in the schools and the difficulties in the schools and he made one statement. He said this, till you fix the families, you won't fix the schools. 
That didn't go over too well at that meeting, but that was the final word. Doing everything unraveling in our society goes back to the unraveling of the family, and all that goes back to the unraveling of fatherhood. Fix the family, you fix the nation. God Almighty created culture so that the foundation of any culture, any nation, is the family. That's why, that's why Satan hates families and is doing everything he can to destroy relationships and families. That's why we have church, so we can heal families, so we can be a family. All right, first thing we're going to look at this morning is family done different. And maybe know we might ought to start doing family different. We've got to learn how to do family. And uh, Jesus drew a group of people together, and he said, I'm going to teach you all how to get along with each other and how to walk as family. So Matthew chapter 20, <clears throat> uh, let me just summarize. We're having, do you remember the, boy, the boys that Jesus started with? There were 12 of them. You remember them? Redneck fishermen, crooked government officials, and then just a few weirdos thrown in. You had a soldier of fortune in there, Matthew. Matthew the zealot who wanted to overthrow the government. He brought a weird bunch around him. I love Jesus. So he gets this group around, and they're acting like lost people in his, part, in his church. And they have ju just finished having an argument over which one of us is the greatest. You can read back this. They were arguing and talking. Jesus walked up. He said, what are y'all talking about? And they were deadly silent. They had a feeling we might better not tell him what we're talking about. Uh, what you going to do? Hide, to God, hide something from him? And they were arguing about which one of us is the greatest. Don't that sound just like America? I've never seen but one problem in a family. One. And every problem I've ever seen in families goes back to one thing. Selfishness. Selfishness is the root of every marital problem. Selfishness. Listen, what I want, what I think, how I feel are the three things that are damning our nation right now. And all those three combined just amount to what? Selfishness. It's my way or the highway. If I can't have what I want, I'll tear the place up. Dear ones, selfishness is the root of every family problem. So Jesus gathered them around him, and I want you to look what he said to them after they just got done fighting over who was great. <laughs> my gosh, look what he said. Matthew 20, 25, Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles... You know what Gentile means in the Bible? People who don't know God. Anytime you see the word Gentile, it means those outside my family. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. Those who are great exercise authority over them. What did Jesus say? In the world out there, in that culture, everybody wants to be in charge and be at the top. It's all about me. Jesus said, out there, every, it's all about me with everybody. Now, I want you to look at the next few words. Verse 26. It shall not be so among you. Look at those words. What did Jesus say? We do family different if you're going to follow me. In my church, we live different. I want you to listen to the words. It will not be that way in my family. Now, I've, visited, I've been in over 3,000 private homes in the ministry so far. I've been in homes where it was just hell on earth. I mean... I just wept over what I saw in those homes, the hatred and the anger. Dear ones, your, your status is nothing if your home was not right. I visited in the home in New York City. I was in the Bronx. I visited in the home of a Major League Baseball player. I walked into the home, and there on that, that table in the foyer were several gold glove awards that he'd won through his career. That, you're the best fielder in baseball that year. And we visited in his home for about two hours. And when I left, I told my buddy, I said, I feel so sorry for that family. That wife was so beat down. Those kids were so beat down. He was so angry. I wouldn't live in that home for anything. And that's how people leave. Our homes are in trouble. You ever heard the term dysfunctional family? We not only have dysfunctional families in this nation, we have dysfunctional church families in this nation. And what did Jesus say? This is how they live. But listen to what he said. It shall not be so among you. My family is going to live different. And what's the major change Jesus made in the way we treat each other? Here it is, verse 26. It shall not be so among you. Whoever desires to become great among you, let him become your servant. Dear ones, if you become a servant, it ain't about you no more, is it? It's not about what you think, you feel, and you want. It's about what Jesus thinks, what Jesus wants, and what Jesus feels. Look at the next verse. Whoever desires to be first among you. Now, I heard it. I heard it. Somebody said it right back over there. 
well, I don't really want to be first. You're lying. You're lying. You're lying. Everybody's born wanting to be the he king. Everybody wants their way. <laughs> I should have said that. <clears throat> Verse 27, whoever desires to be first, let him be your what? Slave or servant. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and lay down his life for people. And so this is what Jesus said. This is the way people treat each other out there. But it shall not be so in here and in this group. In church, we're not going to treat each other like those people out there treat each other. I don't know if you've noticed or not, but we're in the deterioration of culture right now in our nation in the way we treat each other. How did we go from Andy Griffith to Beavis and that other guy in just 30 years? We're in a deterioration of culture that was prophesied. But listen to me, listen to me. My personal family, your personal family, and this church family, we are not going to follow the culture off the, off the waterfall. It shall not be so among us. We're not going to live like that in here. We're not going to treat each other like that. We're not going to fight and argue over who gets most of the power. We're not going to fight and argue over who gets to drive and who gets to have their way. We're going to serve each other. Listen, the Son of God who created the heavens and the earth <laughs> at the Last Supper took off his jacket and washed every dirty foot in that room. And then he said, do you want to be happy? Do what I just did. Question. With all the super technology we got and all the crap we've invented in this nation, why is happiness at an all-time low in this nation? Why is psychiatric medicine at an all-time high in this nation? Why are we so, the misery level is off the charts in this nation. Why is it? Because rulers are miserable. Servants find joy. All right, so Jesus said, we're not going to do it that way. We're going to be different the way we treat each other in our families here. Family done different. All right, let's do this. Now remember, Jesus gathered a group of people around him, and he was called their shepherd. Shepherd's a pastor, shepherd them. And they lived together for three years real close, and he taught them, this is how we treat each other. And it took him a long time to get the old junk out of them, get the new stuff into them. And he taught them how to live over that period. All right, I want to ask you a question. And uh, <clears throat> this is sort of a, my gosh, I didn't know that question. What is the only proof in the Bible that you belong to God? So, Brother Brown, I go to church every Sunday. So does the devil. Congratulations. <laughs> Brother Brown, I got one of them great big black Bibles. <laughs> so does a lot of people working in Washington, but any doing them no good, is it? I'm sorry I should have said that. Dear ones, if I were to ask you, what is the only thing the Bible says that proves that you know Jesus? Would you know what it was? Turn with me to John chapter 15 and let's look at it. John chapter 13, let's look at it. Now, dear ones, what has American religion identified as God's people? A bunch of don'ts. We don't smoke, we don't cuss, we don't chew, we don't breathe, we don't smile. We don't dance. We don't listen to Led Zeppelin. You know, all the, the don'ts. That is not what the Bible teaches. What does the Bible say? And, and if you say, well, I don't believe what you're saying right there. Well, look it up and come show me. Listen, I'm always open to anything being corrected. If you can show, now, I don't want to hear what your mama said. I want to hear what the Bible says. <laughs> I don't care what your overweight preacher in a tight suit said either. I want to hear what the Bible says. This is the only place in the Bible where I can find that it says, this is how you'll know they're my people. This is the measuring stick for my people. It's in John 13, 34, when the Bible says this. John 13, 34, where the scripture says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. All right, let me just ask you a trick question here. Did he just say we're supposed to love each other? Go back and read it again. As I loved you. There's a big difference in what we call love today. And what Jesus did when he walked on this earth. He said, this is, did he, does it say commandments plural? Then I have one commandment. Love people. The way God loves people. And look at the next verse. 35 says this. By this, all will know that you're my disciples when they see how you relate to one another. What's the only identifying mark in the Bible that I belong to God? People can watch the way I treat you. And that's how they know I follow Jesus. You say, well, I don't smoke, I don't cuss, I don't party, I don't use crack, I don't have premarital sex. Well, I guess not, you're married. Whatever it is, but listen, listen to me. My basset hound does all that. He don't follow Jesus. I promise you, he don't follow Jesus. 
What does the Bible say is the only mark of a people who know Jesus? Watch how they treat each other. By this, it's not, it's not how you love God. It's how you love people. It's how you treat people. So what's the measuring stick? Listen to me. In many churches, it's important that you've you got to attend their services. You've got to be faithful, faithful to our services. Go to the beach. I don't care. Enjoy your life. Bring me something back. I don't, I don't care if you smoke or not. Smoking won't send you to I mean, smoking is going to get you wherever you're going quicker, but I don't care whether you smoke or not. What is the only measuring stick of God's people in the Bible? Watch how they treat each other. Relationships are the only... What did Jesus come to this earth to do? Teach us how to live with each other. And what did he call it? On this rock, I will build my church. Do you know, the church should be known for what? What they're against? Anti this? Church should be known for how they treat each other. People should be begging to get into your church because they want to be treated like y'all treat people. What should my family be known for? How big our house is? How, big my, how nice my cars are? How we treat each other. We say, well, yes, it's important. It's not important. It's the ultimate. This is the most important thing, according to Scripture, is how we treat each other, and it's the measuring stick that He gives us. All righty. Number three, here we go. Rules for kingdom family. Rules for a great family. How many of you know we've got to have rules? I knew I wouldn't get nothing out of that. What is it about human beings we don't like rules? Don't you understand any place two people are together, you have to have some rules. All right, dear ones, there are rules for families. And the Bible teaches us, and listen to me, they're good rules. They're not bad rules. They're good rules. And you have to have a guideline to have a family. Now, when our children were little, we had rules for our family. They were posted clearly. We kept them on the refrigerator. Basically, just boiled down to honor your mother and your father if, she'll, if she agrees with it. Uh, just honor your mother. <laughs> there was, we, we have to learn how to do family. Let, let, me, let, me, let me go deep here. Listen to me carefully about church, your personal family, everything. You can't build God's family with Satan's rules. We're trying today. You can't build God's family with Satan's rules. Petty jealousy, envy, anger, unforgiveness, got to have my way. Those are Satan's rules for life. How's that doing us? You can't build God's family with Satan's rules. Listen to what the Bible said about rules or, or vision. We'll call it vision. Habakkuk 2.2. Write the vision, write the rules on paper, make it plain so that those who read it can do it. Guess what he did for us? He wrote the vision on paper clearly so we can read it and do it. All right, in the New Testament, there are 27 one another's. Have you ever heard this? 27 one another's in the New Testament. And they're the way we treat each other. Here, let me just mention a few. Be ye kind to one another. That's a good idea. Pray for one another. Serve one another. Care for one another. The 27 one another. Don't worry, we're not going to go through all of them. But dear ones, as a group of people, if you want a great family, I mean you want a great, listen to me, families like sweet tea. When it's good, it is wonderful. When it's bad, it's nasty. Are you with me? The greatest joy in my life is family. The greatest pain in some people's lives is family. We have got to learn how to do family God's way. Since He's the Father and He created us as a family. I'm going to give you this morning about seven or eight uh, rules for family. And let me tell you what we're doing in this house right here. We didn't come together to build a rock star uh, celebrity following here. We didn't come here to build a Taj Mahal and, you know, put beer in the lobby and topless singers suing so many people we can get in here. That's not what we're doing here. <clears throat> we came here to do two things. This church was started for two things. Number one... I want you to get to know God as your father. I want you to hear his voice. I want, you to, I want you to be in a relationship with the greatest man that ever lived. And number two, we're here to build a family amongst ourselves. And you know what number three is? They ain't no number three. That's all we're going to do here. We're not having Holy Ghost ceramics, you know, weight loss classes and call them firm believers. We're not going to do all that stuff right here. We're here to bring people into relationship with God and with each other. That's all we do here. Do you know what? You get that. You got all you need in life. All right. Eight rules for family. Turn with me to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Seven or eight rules for family. And uh, dear ones, I want to tell you something. Family's my thing. As a young man, I made up my mind. I really don't care whether I make a lot of money or not. I do, I do need to be able to eat and pay the power bill. 
I really don't care whether I accomplish anything as far as making a name for myself. I've found that being famous is not as much fun as people make it out to be. Not that I've been. I made up my mind as a young man, we're gonna, if I don't do but one thing right, we're going to do family right. And I've found that family is what lasts forever. Family is the most valuable. I've, I've sat with many, many people on their deathbed. I've never had anybody say, Brother Brian, go get my golf clubs, lay them right here beside me in the bed. I've never had anybody say, I wish I'd have worked more. I've never had anybody say, go get my checkbook so I can hold it close to me as I die. What do every one of them want when they're dying? Where's my family? It was, we need to put family back at the top of the list again. All righty, number one. Here it is. Are you ready? The word is honor. Look with me in Romans chapter 12, verse 10. Romans 12, 10 says this. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love in honor, giving preference to one another. The first rule of any family is honor. When you take the honor out of a family, it soon implodes. Now, honor means two things in the Bible. Number one, valuable. Valuable. Have you ever noticed how we treat some people real good because we think they're important? And we treat other people like crap because they're not that important. Y'all never notice that? You see that all day, every day. You ever notice how we treat the waitresses if our food ain't cooked just right? You know why we treat a waitress like crap? Because we don't think she's important. We don't honor her. I walked into the uh, church, I pa- previous church I pastored, I walked in there one Saturday and they were having this big fancy gig and I wasn't dressed up, I wasn't dressed ministerial like I am now. I was dressed a little ragged because I'd been working in the yard and there was a lady in there and you could tell she was, uh, she was snooty. I, was try- I tried to find a nice way to say it. She was just snooty and uppity. You know what uppity and snooty means, don't you? All right, look it up. And uh, so I walked in there and she said, hey, I'm looking for so-and-so. Can you wear such and such? And I said, I'll see if I can find them. She said, well, they're supposed to be. She was just ugly to me. And uh, she said, now, do you work here? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, who are you? I said, I'm the senior pastor. <laughs> Son, it was a miracle. Everything <laughs> changed about her when she found out who I was. Now, I don't normally pull that card out, but when you need it, I'll pull it out. Because <laughs> all of a sudden, guess, all of a sudden, I'm, I'm important now. And she treated me so different when she found out who I was. Let me tell you something. That's the way pagans live. It shall not be so among you. The Bible is very clear, 1 Corinthians 12. Those we think to be less honorable, the waitresses, the trash men, the homeless, on them we bestow greater honor. We treat them better because our honorable members don't need it. You know, honor, honor means you are important. You are valuable. You know how valuable you are? God so loved you that he gave his son. Listen to what the Bible said in 1 Corinthians 6. You are bought with a price. And we need to treat every person in a family, you treat every person as though they're the most valuable person on this planet. Guess why? They are. There, there is no distinction in God's kingdom. He makes no differentiation between people. So we, learn, we start treating people like they're very important because they are. But uh, let, me just, let me just quote this to you. Consider the birds of the air, how they never toil. They don't, ha- they don't have to grow their own food. Your father feeds them. Are you not more valuable to God than all the birds in the world? Our culture's taught us, hey, that guy can hit a ball. He's important. He's valuable. That kid can't even walk straight. They're not that important. It shall not be so among you. We don't let this sick culture teach us how to do family. We do family by the book. We go back to the Lord. We treat every person as though they're the most valuable person on earth. And listen to me. We do this in our private homes too. When the Bible says, Husbands, honor your wives. I I should have... Seven, eight hundred women standing up screaming right now. <laughs> I, I made a statement one time. I said, I worship the ground that woman walks on. And a fellow took me aside and said, you, you really shouldn't say that. That, that sounds sacrilegious. And I said, shut the hell up. I'll call it what I want to call it. <laughs> I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. I, uh, take that off the race. There. there ones, I worship Jesus above all. But I adore that woman. I mean, I adore her. You know what that's called? 
Husbands, love your wives like Christ loved the church. We have got to quit treating people like the TV teaches us and get back to write the vision, make it plain so they can do it. And honor means to treat people valuable. And let me tell you what else honor is. Honor means to be excited about people. Honor means to celebrate. We need to be excited about people. Is God excited about This is one of the hardest concepts for people to grasp. Everybody's got a, a view of what they think God is like. Let me ask you a question. Is he excited? What's God excited about? People. I can see you looking at me like a calf looking at a new gate. You look like i got three heads on me up here. <laughs> what did Jesus teach us when he walked on this earth? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Listen to Luke chapter 15, verse 1. When the ministers didn't understand why Jesus was so excited about what such wicked people, he answered them and said, If a man had a hundred sheep and lost one, would he not leave the 99 and go after the one that he's lost? And when he finds him, he stomps him and says, Do it again and I'll kill you. No, 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 wrong version. When he finds him, he lays him on his shoulders rejoicing and says to his friends, Come celebrate with me. My sheep which is lost is found. You don't think he's talking about some nasty little four-legged critter with wool on him, do you? He's talking about when God finds people and brings people back to him, how excited he is about people. If God's excited about people, guess who else ought to be excited about them? My grandbaby came in back there this morning as I was back there greeting folks and whatnot, and I went, oh, crap, it's you. <laughs> that is not how we act when grandbabies come through the door. Yeah, look, look. You understand how goofy old people can get when grandparents and grandchildren show up? <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Why not everybody? We need to be excited about people. To honor people means to be excited about them. People are not a bother. People are the reason this earth spins. Jesus created that. I got, I got to hear this more. All right, excited. Years ago, the Lord taught me in prayer the secret to the human heart. God created our hearts. And the Bible said in Psalm 37, 4, that he put desires in that heart. And we all have desires at heart level. That's why he said, delight yourself in me and I'll give you the desires of your heart. And he taught me the secrets to the human heart. You know what the first thing he taught me was? Everybody wants to be somebody to somebody. And every human heart is this desire to be important to somebody. Guess who put that in there? Dudes, if I'm like Jesus, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to treat you like who you are. The desires of the human heart. Everybody wants to be somebody. Everybody needs mercy. Everybody wants to be listened to. Everybody wants to contribute. There are basic desires in our heart, but the greatest desire of our heart is to be important to somebody. Guess where people ought to find that? Those people are looking for family. People are looking for family. Why would a little black boy, 13, 14 years old, maybe 15, raised in the hood, why would he let the Crips shoot him in the foot with a 22 pistol so he can join their gang? Ain't nobody shooting me. Nowhere to get in your club. Why would that little boy, that's one, that's one of the initiations to get in the crypts, one of the gangs. They'll let you got to shoot, get shot in the foot with a pistol. Why would you stick your foot out and do that? Because they didn't have, they're so desperate for family. They're looking for somebody to care about, something to belong to. Everybody longs for family. And everybody wants to be important to somebody. Yay or nay? When you say to people, you'd, you'd never say this with your mouth. You might would. Some, we're getting in a culture where we do it. But when you say to people, by the way, you look at them and treat them and whatnot, you don't mean crap to me. You destroy the human heart. The, in this house right here is the place where people ought to know, I am valuable to them people down there. And we need to be excited about people, the human heart. All right, all right excited. i got to move on. All right. Number three, celebration. Look with me in Romans chapter 12, verse 15. Verse 15, rejoice with those who rejoice. Isn't that different from our culture? When somebody gets blessed or something good happens to somebody or they get a new car or they get a new job or they get something we didn't get, we're jealous. We say you didn't deserve it. What does the Bible say? You need to celebrate with people when good things happen to them. You know what family's for? When good things happen, let's all celebrate with them because something good's happened to them. That's what church is. We come into church here and then we find out, you know, so-and-so got a new job. Let's celebrate and have a big time. So-and-so got a boyfriend. Let's celebrate. So-and-so got rid of their boyfriend. Let's celebrate now. We need to... <laughs> Not your husband, your boyfriend. Hey, right, listen to me. We need to... What's it called? 
shared celebration. We need to rejoice with people that rejoice. Dear ones, there's so uh, shared celebration. When something good happens to you, I'm so excited for you. You know what you have to do before you can celebrate with people that good things are happening too? You have to get rid of the selfishness. You have to die to self and become a, what was the word Jesus used? Servant. Let me tell you something about my, my father's kingdom and family. The way up is down. Everybody in this nation wants to go up. Somebody told me they said, that girl's going somewhere. I said, Eli Whitney? <laughs> Snow camp? Where are they going? I knew what they meant. They meant they're going to go. They're going to do great in life. Dear ones, to do great in life, you become a servant in his kingdom. All right. Celebration. Look at the rest of that verse, verse 15. Romans 12, 15. Rejoice with those who rejoice. And then what? Weep with those who weep. In the family, we suffer together. It's called shared suffering. You get a group this big right here, I promise you there's some pain in this room right here. There's some hurting going on in this room. Why would people come into a church and straighten up and try to act like everything's right? Because we're not sharing and suffering. Now, I'm not talking about just bleeding all over everybody all the time. We'll get you some counseling and get that straightened out. But there's, there's bad things happen to people. You can be a Christian and terrible things can happen. I don't care how spiritual you are. Somebody's going to die one day. The kids go off the rails. You get fired for no reason. Bad things happen to good people because we live in a fallen world. Well, what are we supposed to say? We're supposed to say, let me share in your suffering. What does it mean, weep for those who weep? We need to share in people. So I have a friend, Fred Treadwell, pastored here for years. And uh, Fred had a little boy. He was two years old. They put him to sleep one day in his little crib. And the, the string from the blinds got in that crib, wrapped around his neck, and killed him while he was taking a nap that day. Two-year-old baby. Fred said, I've never been so devastated in my life. He said, of course, the rescue squad came. And just a few minutes later, a deacon from my church showed up. And he, wasn't, he was sort of farmer type, didn't speak much. Said he came in, he hugged me and cried, and he sat down in a chair. He said that was in the morning. And he sat there all day, said at about 9 o'clock that night, he stood up and he said, well, if you need me, I'll stay. But if you don't need anything else, I'm going to go on. I love you. Fred said he didn't say a word all day, but him just sitting there. I'd, I'd look over there and the tears would be in his eyes. He said that was the greatest thing that happened to me through that time was having somebody to weep with me while I wept. You know, we, need to, we need to, listen to what Jesus said, lift up your eyes and look at the fields. Get your eyes off yourself and look at people. I watch people all the time trying to find out by their faces what's going on. What's going on with them? What's happening here? We need to, uh, I can't see your pain if I'm all wrapped up in me. That's why we die to self. Jesus said, lift up your eyes and look at the people. And when they're suffering, go there. And there. We need to share suffering. Church is not only a place where we celebrate together, it's a place where we suffer together. Do you know how many parents are sitting in this room suffering this morning? And uh, we may not need to discuss it. You might just need to put your arm around them and tell them I love you. I'm going to be praying for you. This is a place where people share suffering. That, that's a family where we suffer together. We celebrate together. We suffer together. Number four, rules for the family. Turn the page. Romans chapter 14. Let me tell you what my church is. And my church is going to stay this way because I'm in charge here. <clears throat> this right here is what we call a no judgment zone. Rule number four, this is a no judgment zone. Let me make, a ju let me make an announcement. You know why you don't need to judge anybody? And look down your nose at somebody? Because the job of God has already been filled and you don't need to apply. I just heard it. One of my friends just said, yeah, but you've got to straighten people out. I'm not, I don't want to say that H word again. Listen, Romans 14. <laughs> Look at me, Romans 14, verse... Uh, well, let, let me to cut down. Look in Romans 14, verse 10. Why do you judge your brother? Why do you show contempt for your... You know what it means, show contempt for your brother? Why do you look down your nose at people that are in trouble? Why, why are you so judgmental? Why do you look down your nose at people that are not doing well? Look what the Bible says. We shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Verse 12, each shall give an account of himself to God. You know what he's saying right there? You don't need to judge anybody. They're going to stand in front of God one day. So you take the day off. 
Well, Brother Brian, if I can't judge people and try to figure out who's acting like an idiot and I can't look down my nose at them, what am I going to do? Verse 13, Therefore let us not judge one another anymore, but make up our minds. I will not put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in my brother's way. You know what he's saying? Quit looking down your nose at people and help them up. I mean, it's just simple put. This is a no judgment zone. Now, if you're, if you're having a problem, I might come to you and say, look, Doc, I love you. We can do better than this. If you don't quit beating your old lady, she's going to shoot you one night while you're asleep. You understand what I'm saying here? Our job is not to judge each other and look down our That's a religious spirit. Our job is to what? Help them stand. You'd be surprised at the people. If we just get off our high horse and love people and say, can I help you? Instead of running from church wounded, they could get straightened out. Church, church is a house where you find healing. I'm not so sure I don't know more people that have been wounded in church than healed. Listen, God's job is taken. We ain't receiving applications no more. He to judge, you to help her. Let's settle that. This is a no judgment zone. Yes, sir. Number five, abundant kindness. I want you to turn with me to, uh, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. All right. This is one of the greatest passages. This may be the key passage in the Bible about how many you're supposed to relate to each other. How we're supposed to treat each other. Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, our nation has sunk down into this hateful treatment of people. I, I don't know why, what, what in the world. How did we get from Andy Griffith to where we are today? How did we get from Mayberry to hellhole number one? How did we get here? I don't know and I don't care, but I know this. You listen to me. It shall not be so among you. I'm not going to live like that. My family's not going to live like that. I've been in homes where people broke into fist fights and hit the floor. We're not going to live like that in our house. I'm not above anybody. We're not better than anybody, but we're different. It shall not be so among you. I've been, in, <laughs> I've been in churches where people got into fist fights during business meetings. That's what you get for having one. But the church, we've gotten fist fights for business meetings. How many of you know the people of God should not be hitting each other in the head? <laughs> and the dang preacher threw the first punch. Not me. I don't do it. I think, I'm just standing there going, no wonder people won't come to church. What is wrong with this? This may be the greatest passage on relationships in the Bible. Let these, look at these words right here. Ephesians 4, 32. Ephesians 4, 32. Be ye kind to one another. Let me make an announcement. And nobody wants to hear your message if you treat them like crap. Don't you understand you open the door to Jesus and to the human heart by the way you treat people? I think I told y'all. Well, I'm 66. I don't have to remember what I told anybody. I, I, I told you one time about the girl in the Burger King. And I've had this happen so many times. I go into Burger King and there's a, you know, they herd you like a bunch of dang cows through that line. And I get up there, a little 16, 17-year-old girl. And the fellas, he's, he's, he's ordering. He's just rude to her. I'm getting ill. He's about that tall. And he's being rude to this. She's just a teenage girl trying to make a little money in high school. He's being rude to her. I'm getting ill about it. I've still got a long way to go yet. I'm getting ill with him, and I'm starting to bear down on him. And then he pulls out a coupon, and she says, I'm sorry, the coupon's expired. He went off on her. Like she said, today when I go to work and that fool comes in with that coupon, I'm going to cancel it. She don't, she don't make the rules. He's being ugly to her, and I can see he, she's fixing to cry. And if she starts crying, I'm going to go on him like white on light. I'm going to clean him out. You don't, make, you don't treat women like that. So, brother, what kind of preacher are you? Do you remember when Simon whooped out his knife and cut the man's ear off <laughs> after discipleship training with Jesus for three years? <laughs> All right. And he was just hateful to her. And I, I'm ill. Man, my temperature's rising. So he, he's, he's, you have to move down to get your stuff. So he takes off two steps, and he steps back toward her, reaches in his pocket, and pulls out a track that has a smiley face on it that says, God loves you. Laid it down, he said, you need to read that sometime. Oh, I'm reaching for my buck knife now. I've had all I can stand, buddy. I'm f I start to tell her, look the other way, honey, because I'm fixing to carve him up like a Thanksgiving turkey. <laughs> but you know, I, just because you feel it don't mean you have to do it. So I let Mr. Fool walk on, and uh, I tell her feelings hurt. So I just leaned over the counter. She said, can I help you? And I said, are we having fun today or what? And I began to talk to her, and she relaxed. And then I got her laughing about how stupid he was. 
I ordered, got done, and I walked off. And I, as I was walking off, I just reached down and picked that track up. I said, did he give that to you? She said, yes. I said, I wouldn't read it. She said, don't worry. I put it in my pocket. I pulled it back out and said, if I give it to you, will you read it? She smiled and put it in her back pocket and said, I'll read it if you give it to me. Listen to me. The way we treat people is what opens the door to God's goodness. You can't treat people like crap and expect them to want to be like you. Can I get a witness? <laughs> Dear ones, you're the light of the world. You're not the sewage pipe of the world. You are the light of the world. Be ye kind to one another. What's the next word? 29. Be ye kind to one another. Tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God forgave you. Now, we've got to remember this. I'm alive today for one reason. I haven't earned it. This is the mercy of God that I'm breathing. He's been kind to me, and I'm going to go a little further. Now, don't let the chapters mess you up. Verse 5, therefore be what? What does an imitator mean? Imitator of God. What does it mean? I'm going to watch you. I'm going to watch you, and I'm going to act just like you act. What's the verse above it say? Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. You ever heard anybody say this? You're just like your daddy. Just like your daddy, I swear you're just like your daddy. Dear ones, our goal in life is not to impress people. Our goal is to be just like our daddy. What does that tell you right there? Be imitators of God because you're kind to people, you're tender hearted toward people, and you forgive people quickly. Be imitators of God as dear children. Dear ones, we're as children. You ought to be like, our goal is to become like our father. All right, in the way we treat each other. Abundant kindness. Listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. Do not let this pathetic, hateful, sick culture cram you into its mold and teach you how to treat people. You let Jesus teach you how to treat people. We're followers of Jesus, not Lady Gaga. Of course, she's got that disease now. All right, number six. Since we're on it, can you believe that God would say in here, forgive one another, forgiveness? wonder why God would tell his people to forgive each other. Matthew chapter 18, Simon came to Jesus one day and said, Master, how many times do I have to forgive my brother? wonder why he asked him, how many times do I have to forgive? Do I have to forgive him seven times? Because apparently he was about there with somebody. And Jesus said, no. Jesus said, 70 times seven a day, which is 490. So bless God, my husband, I can get up there some. I get pretty close to it some days. Why would God have to tell the people of God to forgive one another? Why would he have to say that? Let me give you the definition of a great marriage. Here's what a great marriage is. Two great forgivers who have decided to live together. Now, I'm, I'm going to make an announcement. I make mistakes. I say hell in church once in a while. I, I just, I'm trying, not as hard as you are, but I'm trying. Then was, we screw up. I can't give but two amens out of we screw up. Yeah. Let me make an announcement. I'm on Facebook now. I know you screw up. <laughs> I, will, I preached for 40 years and never looked. I got on it last September. I know what the hell y'all are into these days. <laughs> I know what's going on. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, but friend me. I'll find out what's going on. <laughs> Listen, why would God say forgive one another? Be you kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Because people make mistakes. All right, I'm fixing to make an announcement here. The way demons get into your life primarily. What's the primary way demons come into your life and wreck you mentally? What's the primary way? It's not drugs. It's not psychotics. What is it? Unforgiveness. Unforgiveness is Satan's door into your mind and heart. And the people that I've known through the years that had, they were just tormented mentally. It always goes back to one thing. They did me wrong. They went, yes, yes, they did you wrong. But if you don't become a forgiving person, you can't have a family. I mean, you know what a marriage is? It's two porcupines trying to get warm by getting close to each other. <laughs> You're going to have to learn how to forgive. They went, I'm telling you, the bait of Satan, as John Bevere's book says, is unforgiveness. You can't have a church if people don't forgive each other. We're going to make mistakes. And listen to me. Not only do we need to forgive each other, we need to live in a I know you're merciful atmosphere. 
Nobody can live under the tightness and the rigidness of, you screw up one time, we throw you out of here. Nobody can live under that. Now, we don't need to be so sloppy that we just act like idiots and excuse it. That's the other ditch. But if people need mercy. Blessed are the merciful, they will find mercy from God. How many instances could I give you of people I've dealt with? Uh, I had an aunt. She was done wrong by her brothers growing up. She married a man that treated her wrong, and she seethed with hatred. I mean, she, her jaw was clenched. She just seethed with hatred. When I was 13 years, she was, in, she was in World War II. She was a nurse in World War II, served in the Pacific. When I was 13 years old, she was locked up in a, in a uh, veterans mental institute and spent 45 years, the rest of her life, in that mental institution, rocking in that chair. No man will ever do me like this again. And she died a miserable, bitter old woman. Her prison could have been unlocked. She had a wonderful family. Satan robbed those kids of, her, of their mother because of the bitterness. Dear ones, the cross means I forgive you. You're forgiven. I want to make an announcement. I pray this prayer every day. Dear Jesus, nobody owes me a dime. The enemy will try to write that ticket and I tell him, you get the, I guess today's my day for the H word. <laughs> you get the hell out of here. Uh, you're not catching me through this unforgiveness mess. We're going to live in a culture of mercy. And uh, <laughs> once in a while, listen, kid, how many of you know kids make mistakes? You know, a kid spills milk and we start screaming and go crazy. You're never going to have a family. Little hands can't handle milk. We need to be a merciful people. All right, I got to quit. Uh, forgiveness. Let me, let me, since we're here, how many, ever, how, many of you ever, how many of you like to be encouraged by people? How many of you feed on encouragement? God made your heart to live on encouragement. We were not made to live on the news. Let me, let me teach you about your heart and mind. You're just like a computer. Listen to the law of the computer. Here it is. Garbage in. That's your heart. Garbage in, garbage out. Good in, good out. Look with me in that same passage right there. Verse 29. Listen, everybody, everybody, look, before we read, everybody look right here. If you were to ask me, Brother Brian... I can't obey the whole Bible. I don't even know the whole Bible. Could you just give me one verse? I think I could do one verse this year. Guess which verse I'd pick. Ephesians 4, 29 would be the one verse. Let no damaging word come out of your mouth, but what is good to build people up, that it might impart grace to the hearers. Could you imagine? What if a church would obey God and do one verse right there? What if nobody ever opened their mouths that it damaged somebody, but every time they opened their mouths, it encouraged people? Could you imagine what that would be like? There was, my Heavenly Father is the greatest encourager who ever lived. This, listen to what Jesus said. The words that, John 6, 63, the words that I speak to you are spirit and life. There was, when Jesus talks, you stand up and say, we can do this. When Jesus talks, you feel like the most important person in the world. When, listen, when religion talks, it beats you up because you're not doing good. That ain't Jesus. When Jesus speaks, it's life. The woman caught in adultery, the preacher said, we're going to kill you because you're evil. What did Jesus say to her? I don't condemn you. Get up and let's start over. It was God's word. Is, he, he brings good news of great joy. Well, guess what I'm going to be if I'm like him? All right, let me tell you, you can tell people that walk with Jesus. They wear religious clothing and they look real serious about life. That's not Jesus. That's called indigestion. Let me tell you how I can teach you. Let me tell you how you can know people walk with Jesus. You know how you can find people that walk with Jesus? John 7, 37 says this. If any man's thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Spend time with me, and out of his heart will flow rivers of life-giving water. It's nothing about words, about words. You know how you can know somebody's been around Jesus? They're the greatest encouragers in the world. Out of their heart flows words that build people up. Do you know anybody in this land that could use a word of encouragement? You know what that's called in the Bible? Church. That's called church. And one of the real, we, we had these rules in our family. Listen, we, we don't even, we're not even going to pick on each other much in this family. So I'm just picking. We ain't having that crap here. We're going to build each other in this house. We're going to build each other up. And we're going to sit at the dinner table, and we're going to laugh. We're going to build each other up. We had a man visit us. He was a principal. Uh, he's a principal at a school. At the time, he was a teacher with my wife at her school, public school. And he came to eat one night. And I'll never forget what he did. I learned a lot from this man. And he sat down. And you know how you have dinner and then you just chit-chat and talk? The answer is yes. You know how to do that. So, and, uh, 
instead of just jibber jabbering, he sat down and he pushed back. He said, so, uh, Caleb, tell me what you like the most about your sister. And he went, oh, oh. <laughs> that's my son. What do you like most about your sister? And then he turned to them and said, what do you like most about? And he went around the table and said, tell me what you like most. About. That was how he spent his time talking to people. Instead of talking about how stupid my old lady is and how stupid my boss is, why don't we talk like that around people? I need more than that. Yeah. Then listen to me. That's how people out there live. It shall not be so among us. When we speak, life comes out. We build people up. If you can't, just, just so I don't, I don't know how to do it. Okay, let's start down here. Let's start down here. Look at the person behind you and say, you're pretty. Go ahead, let's, real quick. Is that hard or what? I didn't mean for you to preach. Come back up here. Come back up here. All right. Dear ones, the Bible says you will know them by their words. By their words. Words of life. All right, let me quit. Can I throw in number eight? (laughs) Number eight, the rule for a great church family or a great family, dinner. Dinner. Dear ones, great families are built where? Around the table. Great fam- That's why this book says so much about the table and eating together. Luke chapter 22, Jesus spent three years teaching these people how to love each other and how to live different. It shall not be so among you. One day before he was crucified, he said, we're going to have one last meal, get everybody together. He told them where to have it. And Jesus walked in and he sat down. Now this is God Almighty sitting down with rough people. Listen to what he said, Luke 22. I have greatly desired to eat this dinner with you before I suffer. He wanted to spend one more time at the table with the people that love so much. That's why we're fixing to start up small groups and start putting small groups together here. Churches need small groups because you can't eat with this many people. But you can eat with 8 or 10 or 12 and build a small group. Listen, Acts chapter 2 is the picture of the perfect church. It's God's plan for it. And it said that they learned, they prayed for each other, they took care of each other. But the only thing in there it said that, that it mentions twice, they broke bread together from house to house. It means they ate together. Eating together is very important. That's, uh, if this guy meets a girl and he wants, to, he wants to date her, what does he ask her to do? Go out with me. Where does he take her? To eat. Well, you think she ain't got no food at her house? You don't take somebody out to eat because they're hungry. You take them out to eat because that's where you get to know people. Listen to me. Relationships are built and maintained around the table. Stanford University survey I saw recently study on the well-being of children as they grow older. Healthy, happy, successful, prosperous. What do you think the number one factor on the well-being of children is as they grow older? Now, this is not a Christian organization. This is Stanford. Number one indicator, what do you think it is? How often their families ate dinner together in the evening. I knew that from the Bible. Listen, you, you want your family to do great. You kids grow up great. Gather them around the dental table at night. Listen to me. Turn the electronics off. So we we don't have nothing to say. Get you something to say. Look at your son and ask him, what do you like most about your sister? And hope he finds something good. Look at your wife and say, what do you like the most about me? Well, maybe maybe not do that. I look somewhere else. (laughs) Then one's relationships are built around the table. That's why it's so important. And I want every one of you to get into small groups when we start putting those together. That's where life's been. And listen, you've got a personal... I don't mean to hurt your feelings. Well, you know, when I say I don't mean to hurt your feelings, guess what? I'm, I mean, I mean to. I'm fixing to. What's the major difference in our nation today and 50 years ago? 50 years ago, dinner was on the table at 6 o'clock. We all sat around and ate. What's happening today? A dear one says, too much sports, too much dancing, too much travel ball. We need to get back to eating together. We didn't have this fa- Listen, if your family doesn't eat together without electronics, you don't have a family. You're running a boarding house. And let me make an announcement from somebody who's been there. They're going to come a day you wish them kids would come back and see you. There's the window. Do it while you can. All righty. What if we were to build something like this? What if, we were, what if we were to do like Jesus said, let me get a group of people together and let me teach y'all how to treat each other and live with each other. What are people looking for today? 
People are looking for money. They're looking for success. You know what they're really looking for? Family. Everybody's looking for family. Let me tell you where God taught me this years ago. I was in a church in High Point. I pastored there. I got in, we got involved. We became the supporting church for a ministry called His Laboring Few. Steve Irving was my best but dear friend of mine. Steve was the president of the Outlaws Motorcycle Gang. Uh, you know, we got several motorcycle gangs in this area, Hells Angels, Outlaws. And Steve was the president of the Outlaws Motorcycle Gang. He, he was a mean man, a bad man. And God came down in his bedroom one day by himself with nobody else there, and he was powerfully converted. I mean, God's spirit just fell on him, and he was converted. And all he wanted to do after that was just, he got out of the outlaws, just wanted to give his life to Jesus. So he started a ministry much like Living Free Here to help people get through drug addiction, uh, girls with life challenge and problems, and it was a tremendous ministry. We supported him as a church. Me and him became dear buddies. And I'm going out there to see Steve one day at the, his Laboring Few camp, and I pulled up my park, and I came around the administration building there. And in the distance, I could see on the sidewalk was a little retaining wall about that tall, bricks. And there was a lady sitting on it, and she went to my church. Her name was Janice. I knew her well. She was the administrator. And there was a lady that was in the program sitting there beside her. And this lady was sobbing uncontrollably. I mean, she was just wailing. And I saw that, and I thought, well, somebody has died and Janice is telling her or, or something. I knew something terrible had happened to see that. So I went the other way around and went in the office. And I said, Steve, I said, uh, what's, wrong, what's wrong with the girl out there? What's happening? And he said, well, Janice just told her she has to leave. Uh, she, I, I thought somebody died. She had completed the program. It's a six-month program. She'd been through it. And it's time for her to go because he said, I got a waiting list. I, she's, she's doing good. I got to have that bed for people that need help. And her telling her, it's time for you to graduate. You got to go. She was wailing because she had to leave that place. You know what they do to you in them places? They take away your cell phone. They take away your freedoms. They take away your privileges. They tell you you get up at 6 o'clock. You do your Bible study. They tell you when to eat. They tell you what to eat. It's almost like prison. So why was she so upset over leaving? Let me tell you why. That girl had been raised in a home where her mother was a drug addict. Men came in and out of that home and abused her sexually and beat her. Then when she got older... She began to use drugs to numb the pain. Be careful looking down your nose at people. You don't know where they've been. And then the men in her life treated her terrible. She was abused. All she knew in life was pain and hatred and violence. That was home to her. That was family. And to get out of her addiction, she came to his laboring few. She came to this place. And when she came in there, all of a sudden, she became important to somebody. She was treated like a queen. She was loved. She, didn't have to, she was protected. She didn't have to be afraid of anything. She was honored and treated like royalty in that place. And for six months, she saw what God meant for family to be. And now the thought of her having to leave that family atmosphere was more than she could stand. And God spoke to me through that, and he said, that's what church is supposed to be right there. Church is supposed to be a place where messed up people can come and they can find the honor and the love and the acceptance. And if you mess up, we're going to love you anyway. Let me make an announcement. You say hell in church, I'll probably forgive you. <clears throat> you won't tell anybody? I do that to keep certain folks away, just to be honest with you. That'll go over good. <laughs> no, don't, listen, no, 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 no. We don't cheer for people when they say ugly things. We, we don't do it. All right. But God taught me through that situation. That's church. Now, you wouldn't, you wouldn't call that kind of ministry a church, but that's what God meant when He said church. It's a, it's a family. It's a place where people come. That's what your family ought to be. That's what your family ought to be. Billy Graham's daughter, whose son, Billy Graham's grandson, was in Living Free for a period of time. She told me, she said, I was Billy Graham's daughter. He was the number one preacher in America, world, known worldwide, you know, we were expected as Billy Graham's children to live at a certain level. And she said, I'll never forget, I'm living in Florida, and I ruined my marriage, and I divorced. And she said, the hardest day of my life was when I had to go back home to North Carolina and drive up that little mountain road toward Mom and Daddy's house. She said, I was so scared because I had let my parents down, and publicly, Billy Graham's daughter is now a divorced mess. She said, I was so, so nervous going back to that house. 
She said, I pulled up in the yard there, and here comes my dad, lanky, came out, stepped out, said, I had just gotten the door closed. He didn't say a word. He just put his arms around me. And he began to weep. And he said, I love you, and this is your home, and you're always welcome here. See why he did so good at what he did? That was their home. She said, we could always go home where we were loved and cared for. Dear ones, we got to quit building homes that look like the Simpsons. And we got to start building homes that look like Jesus and building churches that treat each other like this and that we follow people like this. All right. I went over a little bit today, but I do it all the time. So I'm sorry. Here we go. That's what we're doing here. All right. Before we close, I'm, I'm going to do It's going to be a little complicated, so I want you to listen very carefully to me here. A lot of times in here, I'll have you turn to each other and say something to each other. Because in the American church, we have built preaching stations with flashing disco lights and smoke machines and coffee in the lobby. And there's nothing wrong with that. But dear ones, God meant for church to be more than a place where you can go listen to a guy fuss. God didn't mean for church to be a place where you go in real stiff and sit here, a guy talk and go home. God said church is a family. It's a family. All right, I want to quote to you my favorite verse in the Bible. And there's many in there about family. This is 1 Timothy 5.1. In your church, do not be ugly to the older men, but talk to him like a father. Treat the younger men like your brothers. Treat the older women in your church like they were your mothers. And treat the younger women as sisters with all purity. I wonder why I had to throw that in there. Let me make an announcement. We don't hit on our sisters. All right, here's what we're going to do. <clears throat> this is step number one. I need participation here. It's going to be tough, so hang with me. A lot of times I have you turn and say something to each other. All right, we're going to do it in just a minute, but you need to listen because it's going to be hard. I want you to turn to the person beside you. Don't, not now, not now. Go ahead and think of the person you're going to turn to, whether you're going to turn right or left. All right, turn to the other one. And I want you to say, I want you to say, I love you. Now listen, here's where it gets complicated. If he's an older man, say, I love you, daddy. If he's a younger man, say, love you, brother. What? <laughs> what is it with men? Why can you not talk without saying man? Hey, man, what's going on, man? How you doing, man? <laughs> Boys. Just turn to him and say, I love you, brother. Now, listen carefully here. If it's an older woman, and I'm going to let you decide what older woman is, you better not screw this up. <laughs> if it's an older woman, I want you to say, I love you, mama. Listen to me. If you say, I love you, mama, to your wife, she's going to slap you naked right here in front of everybody. <laughs> if it's a younger woman and you decide what that is, I want you to say, I love you, sister, and I promise not to hit on you. <laughs> That's called church. Y'all got all that? All right, here we go, here we go, here we go. Turn to your neighbor and say, I love you. Great, now you're making out. I didn't ask you to do that. My <laughs> oh, gosh. Bunch of rebels. I'm in church one day. We're dismissing. Lady walks by and I, I said, hey, come here. I walked over there and I put my arm around her and said, I want you to know I love you. I appreciate you. She started crying. She said, where I live, I never hear that. You'd be surprised people that never are loved by anybody. The human heart was created to be loved, and God is love. And since he's in heaven and you down here, you it. All righty. Question. Are you in the family? Are you in the family? There's got to be a time in your life when you can point back and say right there. Mine was June the 17th, 1975. Some of you were real young then. 1975. And on that day, I realized I'm far from God. I'm lost. I'm a sinner. And if I die right now, I'll go to hell. But God loves me, and I felt that love. And I asked the man, what do I have to do? And he said, get on your knees right beside that bus. There was an old school bus there. Get on your knees beside that bus and tell him you're sorry. And I got on my knees, and I saw Jesus on the cross and realized I did that. That's my doings. And I asked him to forgive me and save me, and he did it on that day. I've been a child of God ever since. <clears throat> he got me out of hell in one day. As you can tell, he's still working to get the hell out of me. But dear ones, every single person, there's got to be a day in your life where you can look back and say it was that day. If you can't name the date, that's fine, as long as you can point back and say it was right there. Let me ask everybody in here a question. When did you do that? Listen, if somebody loves you, they'll tell you the truth. 
If you've never done that, let's do it. Lord Jesus, I want to praise you and thank you for this day. Thank you for my family. I love family. Dear Jesus, it, it just, I just don't believe that a church is a place where we come and tolerate being fussed at and then get out of there as quick as we can. We look forward to being with family. I ask you to build a family here, and I ask you to add to your family now. Dear Jesus, by your spirit, people in here that have never said, today, I want to become a child of God, I ask you to draw them to you right now. Friend, if you want to be a child of God, and you believe that Jesus died on the cross for you, I'm going to ask you to pray a simple prayer seated right there where you're at. Pray it from the heart. He's listening. You, something like this. Dear Jesus, I believe you died on the cross because you love me. You care about me. I believe you're coming back to earth one day. I want to belong to you. Today I ask you to forgive my sins and I turn from them. I make you the Savior and the Lord and the love of my life on this day. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for receiving me as your own. From this day forward, I'll follow you. In the strong name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 All right. Thank you for being here today. I love you. God bless you. Do this before you leave. <clears throat> before you leave, turn to the person beside you and say, I still love you. I still love you. <laughs>